Hello, everyone, and welcome back. Thanks for sticking with us through today. Our next presentation is about speeding up DNF and RPM using copy on write, and our presenter will be Matthew. So uh, thank you for your attention, and thank you for joining us, Matthew. All right. Uh, thanks very much for having me. All right, let's, let's start off with uh, introducing myself. Um, I'm Matthew Almond. I'm a production engineer at Facebook, uh, like my coworker David uh, before me, and I also work in the same team. Uh, but my focus has been different. I've been looking at uh, formats and uh, copy on write uh, as a possible solution to this. Uh, I want to talk about this topic in two parts, uh, with, with five actual points. Um, there's a part of this that talks about the things that already exist today, and then there's uh, some stuff that I want to talk about, which is, doesn't exist yet. It's just a concept for the future. And uh, those are all speculative and um, are hypothetical. Uh, there's a lot of content here. And so if you have questions, uh, do write them down, but I may actually end up answering them at the end. The biggest question is but why even look at this stuff? Um, I'm interested in, in performance, uh, but I'll give you more context on this. Uh, the other reason I want to talk about this topic is that this is an application of uh, using CentOS um, and using uh, the hyperscale SIG eventually to uh, make uh, our work available. Uh, we like all the things that we get out of open source and all the things that are in CentOS today, but we want to also contribute to that. So how do you run services? Well, you put run them in the cloud, of course. But unfortunately, there is no cloud. It's just somebody else's computer, ultimately. And in this case, uh, in, in Facebook's case, there is a cloud, but it's on our computer. So we, so we actually have um, to manage uh, things at different levels. We have real hardware. Uh, we have virtual machines. Not everything's on virtual machines. And we have a lot of containers. So what is on our computers? Most stuff is services um, running in containers. So for the sake of um, keeping things simple, uh, most of the things, um, are all, this is already a solved problem. Uh, we run stuff um, containerized, and uh, that gives us lots of benefits. But there's always still uh, physical hosts, and there's other actual operating system software. That we, for that, uh, we use uh, CentOS. Um, on each machine, we uh, want to think about things like um, the actual kernel, the container runtime, services like log aggregation, hardware monitoring, server selection. These are all things that um, they are run by system D as services, but they are not necessarily containerized. Um, maybe they will be, but uh, they are all things that need to be managed. So how do we do it? We start, we run um, normal Linux servers, uh, which are mutable. Uh, they actually have a regular root file system, which is read-write, and it has a fairly minimal CentOS install. Um, and then to manage this, we use uh, Chef as a configuration management system to change um, the state of the machines. And we run that every 15 minutes or so, and we use it to do lots of things. Uh, we use it to install packages, to remove packages, uh, write configuration files out, do services, it does other things. Um, but this is how we get to go from uh, what the state of the machine uh, is to what it should be. Um, and by definition, it's about item potent. Um, I'm not talking about Chef here, but uh, that anything could be used to, for this purpose. And I want to give uh, a contrast um, for, and I don't want to make this a litany. So this is just a, the alternative is you run a system which has uh, usually a read-only file system, but you keep it as small as possible. Um, and, how, and I want to talk about why that is not actually that practical for Facebook, um, at least not today. Uh, with all those services that we run on bare metal, we have lots of different uh, teams working on those services, and we run, manage multiple concurrent releases. And those releases uh, may be every day or so, uh, every like week. Uh, every, like some things may take a month to roll out. They're all going on at different, at different cadences. So if you look at any given server, you'll find that it's actually different to all the other servers because it has a different uh, proportion of things run, uh, running on it. And so there's no such thing as stable. Uh, there is this thing called old, 
but there's nothing uh, that you can say that a single version of everything. Uh, when you have a large number of servers, uh, it's very difficult to go from any point to, to change everything completely. Uh, so we don't do that. Uh, instead, we actually make many small changes. And uh, this, uh, actually, we've gotten very good at. Uh, this means that uh, if we make a small change, it usually has a small impact, and we do it slowly. Uh, maybe uh, a percentage uh, an hour type of thing, or, or 5% and then 10%. Uh, but we manage that um, uh, live, effectively. The other reason we do this is we want to minimize the service downtime. Uh, if you have uh, a minimal OS, the only thing you can really do is either restart or reboot the reboot server. But uh, if you do that, you lose the advantage of having uh, data in memory. And uh, you end up with a cold cache or things like that. So we uh, we do reboot servers for kernel upgrades and that sort of thing. But uh, for normal operation, uh, we don't. Uh, we will actually uh, start and stop services. And I want to give a concrete example of uh, where uh, managing a server live by configuration management is actually seriously useful. Uh, there was a recent CV uh, for sudo. And I guarantee that every system has sudo installed. Well, I think so. Uh, so you have, if you wanted to fix this, uh, you have choices. Uh, if you have uh, a read-only read file system, uh, you may have to reboot every server to actually get a new version of the image. That would be kind of annoying. Maybe you could do it. Um, I don't think uh, Facebook can today. Uh, but the alternative is you can run an upgrade. And that's really easy. Really, there's no services involved in this case. It's just a command line utility. And uh, if you just run that, everything's great. So we, to install software, we use DNF. And we, use, we, we run it via Chef. And we run it while other services are running. Some of the services are very compute heavy. Some of them use the local storage for a lot of things. And uh, our packages are reasonably large uh, because we ship binaries that are maybe a few hundred megabytes in size, but they also have um, debug symbols in them. And those debug symbols tend to be very, very useful for actually uh, triaging problems in production. So uh, the, package, the packages and files are large-ish, uh, but the value of them being large is actually still pretty high, especially uh, when uh, service downtime is the alternative. The other part about using DNF and by Chef is that there's effectively deadlines involved. You have to run, uh, if you want to run uh, this stuff periodically, you cannot run uh, DNF and let it run for 30 minutes uh, just because the IO is really, really uh, backed up. Uh, that's too long. So you actually have to kill it, uh, which is awful. But um, so the thing that we really want to get down to is that if we make RPM and DNF faster and take less IO, there's more likely that it will complete uh, successfully in the common case. All right, I'm going to give you a 10,000 foot view of how, what DNF and RPM do today. Um, but first, I'm going to start off with um, how DNF and RPM work. Uh, this is a, so th there's three parts to DNF. Uh, there is a depth solver, which takes uh, what you want to do, the intent, like install this package, uh, what repos you have available, what's available in, this, in the ecosystem, and then what's, what's installed, and figures out what actually should happen next. Then the packages are downloaded. Uh, maybe it's one package, often is. If you maybe it has dependencies, it may be two or three packages or ten packages. Who knows? But you must go download all those pieces, and then lastly, you come to actually install those packages, uh, which actually takes those archives and um, installs the actual contents. So the whole thing is DNF. Um, I'm not going to talk about depth solving because that's totally outside the scope of this talk. Uh, note that the installing packages part is actually strictly RPM, and DNF embeds RPM to do this. Let's go down to 5,000 feet. Uh, there's two parts, downloading and installing. Uh, downloading is easy. You have a web server with files on it, and you download it, download files into a cache on the machine, and then uh, through the process, once you've got all things in the cache, you can install the packages onto the file system. Sometimes the cache or is on the same file system as the rest of the things. And indeed, we actually do take advantage of this later. So if you want to break it down to simpler operations that you can um, approximate, uh, you could 
think of the first part as just uh, copying stuff from a, a URL to a file. And then uh, the installing could just be running RPM by hand directly. Obviously, you don't. That's not the point of DNF. But this is what it's ultimately doing underneath, underneath the uh, hood. Okay. So the first part is copying bit for bit. The second part involves decompression and installation uh, together. So here's a single RPM that I wanted to install. Um, it's got uh, three files in it, and it has a particular name. It's called Foo One, and it has a header. The header contains uh, lots of things, signatures. It contains a table of contents, the version, the release, uh, a change log, all sorts of things like that. And uh, when you want to install it, you would download it, and you write it out to the cache, and you'd end up re reproducing the same file. This is um, just a one for one copy. Then, when you install it, RPM will use uh, will create files, and then it will uh, decompress that data, and it will write that the uncompressed data to those files. It will actually do swapping, like temporary files, and and swap them in and stuff. But uh, this is a simplified view. So let's install those files. Great. Now we've got some files installed. And usually at the end of this thing, you'll end up deleting the RPM because now you've installed it, you don't need it anymore. Great. So I want to talk about the duplication part of this, which happens in a couple of places there. Um, the downloading the file from the web server to the cache and then copying the data out of the RPM into the actual file system. Both of those are copying up tests. Uh, the first one is just direct one for one. Second one involves decompression. This is fine, but it's kind of expensive. Uh, you have to do a lot of uh, uh, reading and writing, and uh, writing especially is quite expensive. There are strategies you can use to uh, cheat or do less writing and have the same data available in multiple places. You can use Zim links, you can use hard links. They have their own properties, which are listed here. Uh, but I want to highlight the topic of reflinking, uh, which is a feature available on um, advanced file systems, uh, things like ButterFS, and I believe XFS as well, and maybe some others. Uh, reflinking is kind of like hard linking, but at a lower level. So you can take data and reproduce it without actually copying the data. But it's different because it actually works on the uh, sections of the file. It's not actually about the inode or the, or the actual file identity itself. Uh, reflinking is, and uh, copy and write under the scenes, are the under, underlying system um, underneath uh, snapshots on these file systems. Uh, it's not the same as a snapshot, but it's the actual technology that provides this. Okay, so how, how we saw how it normally works. How does it work with copy on the right? I have an R RPM on a web server somewhere. I have an, another program. Uh, this code is called Transcoder. Its job is to translate um, an RPM into a different format also called an RPM, unfortunately, because that's easier contract for a DNF and RPM to work with. Uh, this is a simple program that takes stuff on standard in and writes stuff to standard out. I've hooked this into the repo. Um, it's not very complicated. And its job, will it will read data off the network. And for the header, it will completely copy it, because there's nothing you can do with that. Uh, but the data gets expanded immediately. So. That uh, green file gets expanded um, and written out once to disk, full size. Uh, it may also be padded a little bit because one thing about reflinking is that it has uh, alignment uh, properties, and so you actually have to uh, add maybe a little bit extra uh, data to align it to the page size or the fundamental block size of the file system. And so you, you end up writing out the whole thing, but large, the full size. Lastly, there's a little footer added to the end. Uh, this is a, because this is a uh, pipe and a stream. You can't go back easily and go and modify the start of the file or change it around. And indeed, you don't want to because that first part contains signatures and uh, other things. So, but so the footer adds a little bit of extra data, and I'll go into detail about what's actually in there. Insl installing is different. You create the files. But instead of copying the bytes, you use reflinking. So that data there is actually re 
referenced twice now. So it's available in the Foo one, and it's also in Path Foo. Um, and this same installation process applies to all of these. So this the data on disk is not um, does not uh, go up uh, very much. And the time to actually do this is um, approximately constant time per file. Um, I, maybe there's a slight uh, aspect of um, larger files take slightly longer, but we're talking about uh, something that's like the cost of a, like a hard link effectively, but to a lower level. Um, okay. So what, what happened here? Um, well, we're gonna change the contract a little bit. Normally you download the archive and you then um, decompress and install later. Instead, we're actually decompressing during download, which means you're, you are doing uh, I, I.O. Uh, writing and you're doing decompression. Because it's on, on each RPM in, in turn, it can actually be um, done in parallel. Each RPM, if you download two RPMs, you can run, have two different CPUs uh, going flat out. Uh, but so if you have uh, regular RPM, it can't, you can't really ad adequately parallelize uh, the uh, decompression aspect. The footer, which I described at the end of the file, contains a few things, uh, three things. There's a bit of magic at the end to say it is, it is a transcoded RPM, just eight bytes constant. There's uh, the digest for the file that uh, was downloaded is actually re reproduced here. Uh, LibRepo wants to uh, verify downloads and the file it just wrote out isn't that file. So uh, what do you do? Well, the actual transcoder will calculate the digest and write it at the end, and then LibRepo has a simple modification to it, so it reads uh, that uh, digest uh, to verify that the file is complete. And because it's at the end, if, if, the head, if the magic's not there and the digest's not there, then it won't verify. And so uh, incomplete or, or, or bad downloads will get deleted and retried. Lastly, there's a table of contents each of those sections is identified not by the path, but the, by the digest of the file. And uh, there's an offset, uh, digest to offset uh, aspect of this. So if you say uh, the headers describe the paths and the, each file has a, a digest because that's what uses, RPM Verify uses. And uh, you can use that to then pick up uh, which section of the file to reflink. So I've talked about the page alignment. Um, on Linux, the most fundamental way of doing the ref linking is an IOCTL. There's also a different system called, called copy file range, I believe, which I haven't used here. Um, this assumes that the cache and the uh, destination files are on the same file system, um, or the same, not necessarily the same sub volume, but on the same uh, same file system. And most servers and most uh, like uh, laptops and other use cases tend to have like one reasonably large file system, maybe home is separate, but uh, um, and boot and boot EFI. Uh, so for the most for the most common case, uh, data is reflinked. But the uh, the cases where the file system is different, like boot EFI is uh, VFAT or whatever the type that is, uh, then that is uh, just copied uh, directly. Uh, the ratio of uh, like files is not uh, with reflinking and via uh, uh, copy uh, by copies, then is uh, most of them are done with ref ranking. So this is okay. So all that I just described, it exists and it works today. But here's the part of the talk where I go to speculating about the future, about what, now I've got all this stuff, what, what else can we do with it? Um, so this is my idea and I'm kind of like, I'm not necessarily selling it, but I'm interested in feedback on this. Uh, but I've got two two ideas and then a use case to talk about. The first idea is a concept called reuse local extents. When we came to download that uh, file, um, we were expanding data and uh, writing to disk. But if you happen to keep data on disk, uh, i.e. if you use keep cache equals true in dnf.conf, uh, you'll keep um, the original RPMs around, um, which Normally, it would be a terrible idea because they are um, not used and, and they are uh, separately, uh, they account for more disk space. But because copy and write shares data, the only difference is that the data um, at the header and at the footer uh, are, are extra. So the, 
uh, the cost is relatively low. Um, you have to do garbage collection, but that's pretty easy. This is something that uh, Facebook's been working on. Been working on this. It's kind of complementary. So if you want to um, save some I/O, um, when the transcoder um, downloads another version of an RPM or a different different RPM, if you happen to have a particular digest already, you can make use of it. Uh, so we'll, we'll we'll download another version. The head is new and different, so we'll copy that. Purple file is new, and so we have to actually write that to disk. When we come to the blue file and the red file, uh, we can actually reflink this stuff. I would write another footer on there. And so normal copying involved, we end up with three references to um, the blue bit and the red bit. So this, this requires using the uh, cache um, keeping and maintaining it uh, to be approximately the same set of things that are actually installed. And the other requirement is that the package cache does contain uh, previously transcoded packages with with uh, with the technical cables. And so this effectively rearranges the um, gives you access to lots of different files in a small number of RPMs as a digest addressable file system. So you can look up um, and find um, in a small number of files a large number of different digests. And if, those data, if any of those files are the same, you can actually use that data again. So the, the effect of this is you get a form of deduplication. If you ever, ever have a file that's exactly exact the same as you had before, maybe an upgrade has one new binary and two different comp and two config files or two other files that are the same, like the, this example I showed you, then you won't uh, incur um, you're going, to, you're, going to, you're going to write to have a bit more data and not reproduce everything again. It's kind of like Delta RPMs, but different. Um, I'm not, the Delta RPMs are better at uh, handling actual changes in files, um, but they have a fairly high cost in terms of IO because they rewrite out a real RPM and, uh, and a network as well. Well, not network, they say network, but they cost a lot of CPU as well. Ultimately, the goal here is to save rights. The downside to this is that we are still costing network bandwidth and CPU for decompression. That data of file that you saw before has a single stream of compressed data, and you have to actually walk through the whole thing in order to actually know you've actually seen all of it. So that we could do better. And so that leads me to talk about the next topic. Uh, this is our. Uh, the previous idea uh, was interesting. This one's a little bit further out there. I have to talk about repos now. Um, repos are where you get your RPMs, and uh, every repo has a prefix. Um, and within that prefix, uh, there is a index file called repo.md.xml. It's pretty small. It's uh, got some digests in it, and it is used to point at a whole bunch of other files. So here we go. Uh, one of them being the primary XML. There's a few others, but uh, this is the one that lists all the RPMs available in the repo. And it contains uh, like the URLs of those things, and it contains uh, digests of the files so that you can verify them, and lots of other data like the um, provides and requires stuff so you can do dependency resolving. So I want to extend this. I think I, think I can extend this. Start out with the same entry point. You have the, the primary XML, and you have um, one or more um, index files referenced in the repo md.xml. Uh, one per type of digest, and so most, most RPMs uh, verify their, their digests by SHA-256. I believe you had MD5, you have that as well. This index is something the client would download and would provide a, a table of contents about what's available in the repo, not from a package perspective, but from a file content perspective. This stuff here um, is relatively small. Um, there is um, literally a table of uh, digest to compress size. And by following the compress sizes, you can actually uh, work out offsets. And so, uh, the other thing we add here is the extra arrows from the primary XML down to the, the index file. That ends up pointing um, 
instead of pointing at the URLs of the, uh, of the packages, it points at the digests of the headers. Um, and the index is paired with a data file, which is the actual contents of files available via HTTP, not intended to be downloaded all at once because it will be all the contents or most of the contents of the repo. And each of those pointers ends up showing, pointing to like a particular range of a file. Uh, I'm gonna give, give, give some context on scale. Um, the index file the client would get has to have, you have to represent every file of the repo. That sounds pretty scary. But let's say there's 100,000 different files. That sounds pretty plausible. If, the, if it's SHA-256, uh, the digest is 32 bytes and the compressed size, assuming that 64 bit systems, eight bytes sensible choice. So you're talking about 40 bytes per file. And so 100,000 things uh, equals uh, four megabytes. And if you've ever looked at the what's in the repo MD XML and primary XML, you'll find that this is actually relatively cheap. It's on top of that, but uh, it's still quite small. And so if you want to download an RPM, um, we can do something a bit different. I'm going to use the same through to RPM. And I've added a couple of red lines showing that uh, the primary XML points at the blue file, and that points at that digest, and then the digest points at which, what range uh, the, the files are in the same order. So you, you know what range HTTP get to get a header. And that data in the, uh, in the data file is compressed per individual file. And then once you've got the header, now you have the table of contents of the full RPM, including all the actual files and file digests. So it's two-step. You get the headers to, so if you've got multiple RPMs, you may download five, five headers at once. And then you can go fetch the remaining sections uh, and you can do ranges of that. And you can have uh, the data um, that is con uh, consecutive, like the blue file and the red file, uh, maybe it could be compressed down to a single range. Um, you just download both those pieces. All right, so summarize what's happened here. The idea is that the organization goes from just being about packages to also including information about files and content. Uh, there's an index, a data file peg type, and they download those indexes. Um, They're not ordered, they are um, just append only effectively. So if a client uh, downloads the state of a repo and then once it downloads um, by updates, uh, it can just get the extra bytes and then you can verify that using the uh, checksum and the repo and the XML. And then you do two-step downloads as I just described. And the crucial part here, and this is the most important part, is that you only download and decompress what you don't have. Uh, if you already have uh, some of these pieces on disk, you use you reuse, reuse the previous extents. Uh, if they're packages that happen to contain the same file, and uh, there are bits and pieces that are shared, like uh, um, init.py stuff, like empty files and stuff like that, there's all sorts of things. Uh, you end up uh, reusing, downloading less things. All right. So those so that's those are the two pieces of like technology I wanted I talked about. I want to talk about the uh, a use case for this. Uh, this is an idea and only one one thing to do with this, but uh, I want to highlight it. If you combine the cow and the local extent and pack repositories, um, you can use it to make uh, image um, um, consumption much much faster. Um, you, so in this case, we can go uh, and use any tool we like to build images, which starts off with any um, file system in a directory. We can package this in RPM. Yes, it'd be quite large. And then we've used a packed repository. We only actually upload or need to add in the differences. So if you have version one of, a, of an image, then another version of an image, the only things that actually get stored are a new header and new uh, um, that whatever files were added to that thing. So if you want to consume this, you just install it. That's it. And if you happen to have, a, if, you have ne if you've never installed any any of the images, uh, you have to download most of it. 
Um, but you'll find that if you have a container running the same OS and has commonality with the base OS, uh, you'll find that the files actually will still will still save downloads. Uh, E.g., bin bash uh, could be um, the same file on the image as your main OS, and then you would not have to download it because you already have one. And lastly, um, if you want to use it for actually reinstalling an operating system, uh, you can do the same thing, you install it, and then you do the um, little switch around trick, which uh, move, renames things up during the RAM disk, and uh, continue booting. This is something that Facebook has done uh, a few years ago where we went from CentOS 6 to CentOS 7 um, to minimize downtime in certain cases. And that uh, turns out to be very, very efficient. All right. So to summarize, what, 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 what has happened here? Well, what you do today, in nearly every case, is if you want to install a package or use software or download things, you have to download all of it. And even if you already have pieces of it already. Uh, so you have the whole the time and the cost is proportional to the uh, sum of the file sizes and the number of files. I believe this is true. For, this is definitely true for RPM. Uh, I believe it's also true for other formats, even like tarballs and Docker images. Yes, there are layers, layers and, and, and the hierarchy of those things, but uh, you have to actually download all of it, um, even if you happen to have pieces of it already. And if you want to um, like reinstall a server just to get it back to a good state, then you can um, you end up rewriting that data out over and over, uh, which is uh, interesting. Um, so in the future, instead of having to download everything every time, uh, you only download what you haven't got, and you have to pay the cost for the number of files. So if an image contains fifty thousand files. I don't know what, what a normal file system looks like. Well, I kind of do, but uh, uh, that, sounds, that sounds plausible. Um, the ref linking of 50,000 files is like a 20 second operation, and you share the data um, between those um, images. The other thing that you get out of this is you get um, a different um, organizational uh, structure. Um, I talked about Docker images, which I just looked at yesterday, just, I, I'm not very familiar with Docker, so if I get this wrong, uh, uh, don't play me too badly. But from what I understand, Docker images start off with a base image, and then they have ideas of having deltas or things that you layer on top as a parent association, and so it's a tree. Um, this isn't a tree, this is a graph. You can go from any point to any point, forwards, backwards, sideways, um, very easily because you just go, you, you get a full list of what's actually needed and you may already have some of that stuff. Um, and then the other the contrast I want to make is that uh, there's a feature in ButterFS called send streams, which is also like ZFS send and receive, which is a way to minimize IO by reproducing content by replaying file up, file actions, like delete this file, change the mode of this file, write in the middle of this file. It is a thing that works. But it's, it's organized by file system, by sub volume, and not by package. So you can't reuse packages, not without rearranging your package structure. You're completely ignoring the file system hierarchy concepts. And you, I lost my plot. Um, you can't go backwards. And if you want to go from, because um, well, you, you can't, there's no inverse operation for this. Uh, if you delete a file, there's not an equivalent data in there to add the file back in. You can't, it just doesn't know that. Um, and if you want to go from A to B, that send stream is great for that. If you want to go to A to B to C, you have to go from A to B to C to do it. You cannot go from A to C, you cannot go from C to A. But with the um, the packed object repositories concept, you can do that. All right, that's quite a lot of content. So. Where are, where, 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 where's all, all this at? So we've got the DNF with RPM copy and write in production at Facebook. Uh, I originally prototyped this on CentOS 7 with Yum, with some all, all sorts of interesting hacks. Um, and that work has worked and it's out to like 95% of prod today. Uh, I had to rewrite last parts of it to work on CentOS 8 because it's DNF. And then I also uh, wrote it in, um, uh, wrote all the, all the crazy monkey patches as proper code. 
And uh, so I, I have uh, proposed this for Fedora 34 as a uh, feature, uh, like an optional feature. Um, practically speaking, that's uh, that was uh, pretty aggressive. Um, my motivation for this, I'll be blunt this, in this, with this audience, is that uh, Fedora 34 is likely to be serve as the base for uh, uh, CentOS and RHEL 9, and uh, it would be very useful if that was there. However, uh, there are some concerns about the, the organization of the code. Um, the stuff is a plugin, and the plugin API needs to be uh, refactored. Um, and there's also another aspect which I learned um, very helpfully from uh, comments on the pull requests, uh, which highlight that this some of this code depends upon um, trusting your mirrors, uh, which is yes, is something that I do because uh, the mirrors that we run in Facebook production are private and trustworthy. Um, but there needs to be more work to actually address that. I have a plan, um, uh, but I have to do the work still. So there's that. So with all those things done, um, that will all become available in the Hyperscale SIG, which would be great. And some other people can try it. It'll also be available by Copper, most likely, and in, and in Fedora, uh, possibly Fedora 35. That's what I'm still shooting for. And then um, once those things are all rolling out, uh, we start looking at actually implementing and testing the reuse local sense and packed object repositories ideas. All right, so that's the end of the talk. So time for Q&A, I think, and here's like some contact info. Um, the Fedora project's uh, change, change proposal is probably the best um, high-level description of this, of this topic, uh, at least for the first part. And I have uh, one part of the code which is in GitHub, um, and so therefore it's a good place to put uh, file issues or uh, otherwise uh, coordinate on things. Okay. And now, maybe there are questions. I, I know a whole bunch of things that passed the screen, but I didn't read them yet. So you had a couple of questions earlier, but you answered them all already. OK, great. So um, if anyone has any other questions, please speak up. Uh, to answer Luna's question about copy on write as, as using DNF RPM on ButterFS, yes, that's what I've been testing this out on. But I do believe it works on it will work on XFS uh, because it supports the same mechanics. Uh, I will be blunt; I have not tested it um, to any, any extent. But I, I'm, if if it doesn't work, I will, I will likely uh, address that, for, especially for the Fedora use case, because I realize that just something that only works on a single file system is probably not uh, the best answer. There was a, an OS tree question. Right, yes, that's a good. So as far as, okay, so this is interesting. Uh, OS tree has some definite overlaps with this. Um, there's some comments that in, in, the, in, in the Fedora project, uh, the, the change thing, there's a, there's, a bit of, there's a section on that. OS tree, as I understand it, uses uh, hard linked um, data structures. Um, so the same files are, the RPMs are unpacked into a, tri into a Pair digest uh, file system, and then um, the files are then hard linked into the real paths. Um, as I, as one of the slides I did earlier, um, that uh, highlights that um, hard links have the property that they can't you can't have uh, the same file with different ownerships and permissions. And even more crucially, uh, mutating these things is much more complicated because if you re if you open a hard link file and rewrite the contents all of the instances of that file uh, get the change. Uh, so this means one of two things. You could either A, run the system completely read-only uh, and have those files completely access un unwritable. It's probably a practical approach. Um, but that means you have to do the, the full reboot thing to, to, re to actually uh, ingest changes. And that's kind of like, I've, got a, I've given context on why I think that is um, challenging. Uh, the other part is, uh, well, the, even if you have that, uh, you can use uh, layered file systems for like a, a read-only layer underneath and a write, writing layer on top. Trying to reconcile that stuff um, and actually handle writes that file system are com is complicated. Uh, so there's that, that, that's the problem as well. Um, I think there's also, I, 
Well, this is either trivia or possibly not, not useful, but uh, I said some files might be um, very common. Um, some files, the empty file is a very common file. And so with hard links, you probably have, you might hit the limit the number of links to that file. And then you have to actually have a strategy for that. And then I, th I suspect that there is an answer to that. But uh, when you're dealing with uh, copy on write, uh, the files share the content, or in this case, no, no content. They don't, they don't share any content. Um, and they don't, uh, if, if one copy gets uh, written, it just forks uh, either one. So you don't need to do that. Okay. Uh, any other questions? All right. Well, thank you very much, Matthew. Oh. And if anyone does have any further questions, please join us in the hallway track where we'll have ongoing discussion of this and other topics. And uh, we will resume on stage in just under 20 minutes with the next presentation, which is our final presentation of the day and is about building an image pipeline. So thank you, Matthew. Thank you all.